Well, welcome everyone. It's good to see you all here tonight. We're going to do a little chanting to start off again. So if you want to open the document, I keep pasting it um, again and again because new people won't be able to see it unless I do that. So if you want to open it up, I just want to share a little bit even before we chant. Chanting is uh, like I, I talked about last last week. A kind of a wonderful way to invoke some protection and sometimes it's a way for me to remember that the Dharma doesn't have to be that complicated. It's often the fabrications in the mind that make it seem so complicated or something I have to learn real hard. <laughs> But often there's something really beautiful and moving, flowing about song or words that flow like chants do. And often in a mantra, it can be just a very simple repeating of something. And that with each repeated word, with each repeated phrase, it's like we're invited to deepen into the, the essence that's there. And so perhaps we can use this as a guide as we do some of the chants tonight. And as I look out at you all, I, I'm just remembering that we've been together on these Wednesday nights through a very difficult year. And how many times I've shown up to a practice group like this remarking about the difficult week that it's been or the difficult time that it's been. And here we are once again, at one of those moments. As we reckon with the, another senseless death of a black man, Dante Wright, a young 20 year old father citizen just out to get his car washed. It feels like a lot. I think everybody I know is having a hard time right now. So I imagine that we are too in our own ways, not prescribing what that hard way looks like. You know, it could be moments of difficulty and really Moments of regularity. It could be deep moments of rage. It could be heartbreak. It could be so many things. So one of the beautiful aspects of practice, one of the beautiful aspects of the path of practicing this path of liberation is that everything is included every expression of life, every way that the heart meets and connects, disconnects with the experiences of now. And so however that is for you, however it's been for you over the last week, is really just right. And so one of the chants that we'll do tonight is this mantra that we chanted last, last time, Buddham, Buddham one day. Dhamma one day, Sangam one day. It's like a deep honoring of the truth of now. These Pali words, Buddham, Dhamma, Sangam, 
They're just pointers to an experience that's universal. Buddha, we all have this capacity to know, to know, to really know, and to deepen into that knowing, like, what is it like for me for now? And to not leave anything out of that. Any emotion, any frustration, any thought, body sensation, anything, any view, any opinion. Like it's possible to know, it's possible to connect. And even when the heart, you know, pivots away, turns away, disconnects, dissociates, there's a lawful reason for that. And that even that is an experience to be met. It's all included, this heart that knows can wake up, ah yes, this is nature, this is real, this is true. Life is really like this for me. It's such a beautiful and simple reality. It's really like this. And it has the farthest reaching consequences. It means that all of our personality habits, all of our bad behaviors, all of our mistakes, all of our moments where we weren't that skillful and every expression of all of those things in the collective also, the ways that the world is not just. It's full of consumption, greed, hatred, ignorance, confusion. It's all nature too, it all belongs. We may not like it and we get to participate skillfully with our experience, but it all is here. So why not turn towards and meet the truth? Like this is what Buddha knows, that this is really important, that this is valuable. And because of that, the heart knows how to open, connect to the way it is, to Dhamma. Ah, yes. Sometimes in deep ways like understanding change or the impersonal nature of experience, nature. And sometimes in really ordinary, simple ways, like uh, I feel cranky, tired, or I feel happy and confused by that. How can this mind be heart be happy, content right now? You know, whatever it is, it's the way it is. No sense in denying it because it is this way, right? And then Sangha, oof. Where do we start with that? can begin by appreciating our Asian lineage holders throughout time from the time of the Buddha who have carried forward the teachings by talking about them. Ah, how grateful is it that we have books to read and recordings and such, but you know, 2,600 years ago, people just had their own voice and their own experience to pass down the teachings one by one. One conversation, another conversation, and then another, and somehow the essence got conveyed over time. It's magical almost. And thankfully there are many people who decided to take up monastic training to sort of exemplify a spiritual life for us imperfect human beings, totally, who dedicate themselves to this path exclusively. And we can be grateful for that. And Sangha can also point to the beauty of community, the challenge of community, 
the imperfections of community. And somehow in not romanticizing community or not throwing community out of our hearts. We learn something about interconnection, belonging. I've been reflecting on just my relationships with family and some of the challenging relationships in my family between us. You know, it's just not always easy and how you know, in moments I can really be grateful for the challenges, even some of the separation, distance. Like, oh, this is part of the experience of being in relationship. Sometimes we have to participate creatively in order to feel safe and protected. And still, you know, get curious about that possibility of love that exists there even with boundaries and limitations and distance. The Sangha is such a rich movement of life. It's the relational field, the relational field that we really should not neglect. So perhaps as we take refuge, we can, or as we do some of this chanting, we can remember the power of the words, feel into the power of the words. And even if we don't have all the intellectual answers that we need to solve the problems of our, that our life or that we're all swimming in right now, personally, collectively, that we can take refuge in something that's deep and meaningful something that's reliable for us, practice. Not answers, but inquiries. Like here we are together living into these teachings. And this is how it has gone on for as long as the teachings have been with us. People just like us living into the teachings together, deepening, Sometimes arguing, debating, getting mad at each other. No, it's not what the teaching's about. It's a really normal, conflict normal. I'm gonna post the chants in the chat box one more time. I did see your message, Robert. I'll try to make sure I do that before the night's over. And then I want to chant uh, the Kuan Yin, a uh, simple Kuan Yin mantra, Namo Kuan Shur Yin Pusa. And in the same way that we would reflect on the refuges, can reflect on this powerful mantra. I'd like to read a little bit of what Kitty Saro says in listening to the heart about Kuan Yin practices and this mantra in particular. Let's see if you can receive the words. Ultimately, Kuan Yin isn't Mahayana, Theravada, or even Buddhist. Kuan Yin is neither, is not, is not gendered. The true spirit of Kuan Yin can manifest in any form needed to awaken, rescue, and pierce the hearts of living beings with compassion. In essence, Kuan Yin is a metaphor for the deepest heartbeat of the universe, a heart that is empty and yet filled with listening a listening that is aware, merciful, profoundly wise, and responsive. 
Through the practices centered on Kuan Yin, I discovered a deep sense of connection with all life. Ironically, even though I was silent sitting alone in a tiny forest hut, I felt closer to my family, friends, and fellow community members than if I'd been sitting in a room with them. I discovered a prayerful dimension to my practice and plunged ever deeper into this mysterious Kuan Yin Dharma door, the crux of which is merciful response emerging from emptiness. Merciful response emerging from emptiness. The deepest heartbeat of the universe. Connection and closeness. So this surrender, this beckoning of this compassion and energy, Kuan Yin is the embodiment of compassion. can help us remember to connect. And this is a bit longer passage. In the Sharangama Sutra, Kuan Yin reveals her enlightenment through contemplating sound and returning the hearing until all distinctions dissolve. Suddenly I transcended the mundane and transcendental worlds and throughout the 10 directions of perfect brightness prevailed. I obtained two supreme states. First, I was united with the fundamental, wonderfully enlightened mind of all the Buddhas of the 10 directions. And I gained a strength of compassion equal to that of all the Buddhas. Second, I was united below with all living beings in the six paths, and I gained a kind regard for all living beings equally. I love this, talking about returning, returning the hearing, contemplating sound. Kuan Yin reveals the secret from which springs her inconceivable powers of response. Response, doesn't that? Just point to action, participation. Who exactly is Kuan Yin? Kuan Yin is not Eastern or Western, male or female. The accomplishments of bodhisattvas and realized beings represent our deepest nature, our true heart. They are not beings of the past, but beings of the future who demonstrate our potential. Master Hua, who introduced us to the Kuan Yin Dharmas, used a lot of humor in his teachings. There is a practice that is popular with devotees of Kuan Yin, reciting her name over and over, Namo Kuan Shur Yin Pusa, Namo Kuan Shur Yin Pusa. This means I return my life to the one who listens to the sounds of the world at ease. I return my life to the one who listens to the sounds of the world at ease. This mantra is a concentration practice which protects the mind. It is also a faith-based practice calling on Kuan Yin's merciful response to help doubting Westerners who are skeptical by nature. Master Hua said, if you can't say Kuan Yin's name, say your own name. When you know who you truly are, you will meet Kuan Yin. This is Refuge in Buddha right here. When you know who you really are, you will meet Kuan Yin. Master Hua's teachings often followed in the paradoxical style of the Prajnaparamita texts, which at every turn both postulate the true wonderful nature of reality and then set about deconstructing the very premise they propose. In the end, it really leaves us nowhere to stand other than in the simple awe of the indescribable mystery. True emptiness does not obstruct wonderful existence. Wonderful existence does not obstruct true emptiness. True emptiness isn't empty. Wonderful existence doesn't exist. 
because true emptiness isn't empty, it is therefore, therefore called wonderful existence. Wonderful existence doesn't exist. And so it's called true emptiness. Master Hua. Let us take a moment to let the teachings of Quan Yin penetrate the heart. And it's okay if some things land and some things don't. It's the nature of the teachings. They're to be practiced over a lifetime and longer. And with time and patience, persistence, we get a little closer to the truth, moment by moment. Okay, so I thought the um, the chance we would do tonight, just two. Um, we'll do the mantra chants. On the last page, page three, the mantras will do the first one, Udam Wande. And then we'll do the third one, Namo Kwan Shuryen Pusa. Namo Kwan Shuryen Pusa. Right, we'll start with the Budam, Dhamam, Sangam, and then it'll just play through once. It's about a minute long with Tanisara and Kitisaro chanting. And then after that, we'll just chant on our own. So I'll hopefully, I'll do my best to carry a tune for us and you can just keep your, uh, your audio, keep yourself muted and uh, we'll do it for a few minutes. Budam, Budam, Budam on Damam, Damam, Damam on Sangdam, Sangdam, Sangdam Budam Dhamam Sangam Wande Budam 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 Wande Dhamam 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 Sangdam, Sangdam, Sangdam one day, Budam, Dhamam, Sangdam one day, Budam, Budam, Budam one day. Dhamam, Dhamam, Dhamam one day. Sangam, Sangam, Sangam one day. Budam, Dhamam, Sangam. Budam, Budam, Budam one day. Dhamam, Dhamam, Dhamam one day. Budam, Budam, 
Buddha Monday. Dhamma, 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 Monday. Sangam, 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 Monday. Buddha, Dhamma, Sangam. Nano quantum no quantum Buddha No quantum Buddha No quantum Buddha No quantum Buddha no quantum, Buddha. 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 No quantum, Buddha.
Receiving. Receiving any resonance in the heart. I turn my life to nature, not holding on to anything. Trusting that nothing whatsoever should be clung to. And return every breath, every sound, every experience, back to nature, not taking anything personally, not appropriating. Just returning. And we do this again and again and again. Deepening deepening breath by breath. Allowing everything to move. Inviting everything to move. This is the Nietzsche. Life is in a constant process and we often misunderstand But in moments we can feel something. We can feel change. We can learn to let go. We can feel how the breath has got its own rhythm. Emotions have their own rhythm. Everything moves.
And as this heart deepens moment by moment, notice how it feels. We'll continue in silence together.
And opening your eyes when you're ready. Take a moment to move and adjust, take care of the body. I'm wondering how that practice was for you, the chanting and the sitting. Okay, anybody want to share? That to me reminds, it really brings home the, the point of returning, returning to nature, not having to be the one to do the equanimity. Yeah. What else? can be a powerful force. And just like you were saying, it can be kind of soothing to the turbulent heart. And the chanting is one part of that soothing, but it's the unification and the surrendering to the, the activity of making sound. It's also a part of it. And it's really nice to be able to feel that, oh, this is soothing. Like, it's good to remember that, especially, you know, I don't know about you, but there have been moments when it just feels like the heart is just on fire. I don't even know what it is, but it's so powerful, the suffering that's there. And yet to remember that this heart can be nimble, it knows how to soothe itself. You know, it just needs a little prompting sometimes. So I remember these words, sweetie. Make these sounds, sweetie. How about just do it in this cadence that somebody else has designed? Just see what happens when you just do this over and over. And it can be supportive. I think I told you um, one of the things Kitty Sorrow said at the, I don't know how long ago now, but Trump was still president. And he was, he said that he doing push ups and sit ups in the morning, just as a reminder to keep his body healthy because it's, it's going to be a haul. He's going to need all of his energy to, to resist, to participate. And so this is, I think of chanting in our dedicated practice time, even though, you know, we're practicing all day long, these moments of seclusion that we give ourselves over to a particular thing like chanting or sitting quietly is a way of strengthening the muscle of the heart to be nimble and to be able to be on, you know, trust that when it's on fire, it will return it's possible to to just be nimble flexible that way nothing's going to stick everything is in flow and it's like with exercise exercise can feel good in the moment and it can be beneficial in that moment but it's a kind of investment right it's like brushing your teeth is a kind of investment in tooth health <laughs> Exercise is a kind of investment in body health. Eating good food is a kind of investment in the health of the body long-term. Well, this offering, this generous surrender for a period of time can be a kind of investment. An investment in, in training isn't quite, 
quite the right word, but it's like building, building capacity. Realizing that we can be bigger than we think we can be. The heart can really include more than we think. So many times over this past week, I've thought, well, I don't know how much more of this I can take. It feels re unrelenting. And yet somehow the heart is right there with that feeling. And then able to soothe again and turn. So what else came up for you? Either with the chanting or the practice tonight or through the week? Shinsen Young has these little like, formulas and one of them is um, suffering, uh, pain times resistance equals suffering. Pain times resistance equals suffering. So there's some unpleasantness, some pain. And then there's, let's say the pain is like the equivalent of 10, give it a, give it a number. And resistance is equivalent of 10. Well, now suffering is at 100. But if we have pain at 10 and resistance at 5, well, now suffering is only at 50. And we just cut suffering in half by, by learning how to not resist. And I like these. I like that um, in part because it, it really points to how pain itself is not the only important thing. It can feel like, wow, this, you know, this is supposed to hurt or something like that. This is supposed to hurt. So because it hurts this bad, you know, it's supposed to feel like this. But to think about the impact of resistance on the felt sense of pain is kind of remarkable. Like there are just stories of so, so many stories of, um, you know, one thing that comes to mind right away is, you know, so many stories of people that have endured great pain and found a way to not suffer as much. Like Nelson Mandela and his more than 20 years in prison as an example or on a kind of mundane level, people who, there's so many people who can't tolerate anesthesia and learn how to do clinical, some kind of hypnosis training in order to get through surgery. That's amazing to me that the mind is that strong. So the pain isn't the end of the story for us. 